Now, look at the entrance of this thing. John Houchins. You see, in about 1798, according to legend, John's family sent him out to do some grocery shopping. Now, back then, there were no grocery stores, so what John was given, instead of money, was a rifle about two feet longer than he was tall. And what his family expected him to show up with was a little meat. They expected John to bring back his gear maybe a wild turkey. But they miscalculated just a little because John was an ambitious young man. And when he was on the hillside up above us here, he saw a black bear. Filled with ambition, he took careful aim at that bear and he fired. And he hit the bear, but he didn't kill it. And the legend says that the wounded bear ran down the hillside and into the cave and John ran in after it and he rediscovered Mammoth Cave. Now that's a legend. And there's some of us here who are a little bit unsure about that story. You see, you like to think that a young man raised on the frontier would be smart enough not to chase a wounded bear into a black hole in the ground carrying a single shot rifle and already fire. There's a different version of the story. And in that other version of the story, John shot the bear. But the wounded bear did the chasing, and John ran down the hillside into the cave. That's a little bit easier to believe. And here John stayed until he was sure it was safe to come out. But regardless of which version of that story you might believe, it didn't start to circulate until about 50 years after the cave had appeared on a deed. And in that early legal document, this cave was described as a saltpeter cave. Now, you may know that saltpeter, potassium nitrate, is the main ingredient in black gunpowder. And if you didn't know before, you could probably figure out that black gunpowder is pretty important to the
going. There are a lot of neat things about this room, but my favorite, I think, is its age. You see, scientists tell us that the water left this level of decay between four and a half and six and a half million years ago. This is one of the oldest places you can be inside anywhere. And long before there were human eyes, this room looked pretty much as it does right now. Folks, make sure the flash is off on those cameras, please. Now, that's true of the walls and ceilings, but the floor has changed dramatically, as you can tell. What we see here are the remains of a small Peter mine. Now, that mining operation was active. The war we were fighting was exactly 200 years ago, the War of 1812. Rather than taking a single bag of dirt, African-American slaves would fill these huge boxes with dirt. They would pipe water from the entrance of the cave, cover the dirt in these boxes with that water. As the water slowly seeps through all of this dirt, it would draw the nitrates out. So at the bottom of these troughs, you'd have a nitrate-rich water. They'd pump that to the surface, put it in big iron kettles. There were about 60 of them up there right where we came into the cave. They'd start to cook that down. They'd add turnips. They'd add carrots. They'd add ox blood and wood ash. Anything they could think of with potassium in it, they wanted to make a high quality potassium nitrate. See, they were selling all this to a young Frenchman. Before the War of 1812, we got all of our salt from India for 12 and a half pounds. But after the war began, the price of saltpeter rose to a dollar fifty a pound. So they came down here and they made it, and all of the saltpeter made here, four hundred thousand pounds of it, was purchased by a Frenchman from Wilmington, Delaware. See, he just started a chemical company. He was intent on being successful, and some of you know his name. E.I. DuPont, that's where the DuPont Chemical Company started. Amazing. Now in 1815, the war ended. The price of saltpeter fell to 10 cents a pound. What do you do with a cave this size? Many of the owners just walked away bankrupt, but one of them had an idea. His name was Archibald Wilkins. And Mr. Wilkins said, you know what? I know people. People are curious. I'll put a door on the cave and I'll lock it. I'll charge people to come down here. Well, his friends knew he was crazy. But that was 200 years ago. And today, this afternoon, you joined in the tradition of coming into Mammoth Cave to see what it's about. We're going to make our way deeper into the cave. As we do, well, we're going to pass another group. So stay to your right as we go deeper. Many of these as they could carry on their back, 
They'd make their way through the cave until it got too dark to see with the sunlight coming in from the entrance. They'd take smudge, and that was usually a goldenrod or some other flower that was kind of glowing with a cinder. They'd create a flame from it, they'd light a torch, and they'd head off into the darkness. Come on over, take a look at these artifacts that we have found inside the cave. Now, the torch they had was burning for about 35 to 45 minutes. And they got too short to hold it. Well, they would have to do a couple of things. One of them we've already figured out. They light another torch. The second thing they do, though, is very elegant and very simple. They take another torch off their back and lay it on the ground right there. You see, if it took one torch to get this far into the cave, it was going to take one torch to get from here back out to the surface. And so they made their way through the cave, lighting the torch, laying the torch down. When they lit their last torch, it was time to go, and they'd make their way back to the surface, picking up those torches as they went, using them to light their way out. Now, it sounds pretty simplistic, but it was effective. You see, these are the people explored and made use of between 14 and 16 miles of this cave. They got as far as three and a half miles from North Carolina using a lit stick. If I got a burning stick, my curiosity is going to get it about the time I hit it was a big room back here. Because they were a little more persistent. I've been in parts of the cave where I had a fall.
they had to hurry it up. It's kind of like a patent for an animal. He did a supper. And the thing that Raffinesse was really good at was getting in somebody else's work as his own. Matter of fact, he did this so often that many animals discovered in North America have a small lowercase r in parentheses afterwards for Raffinesse. Because nobody really trusts that he did his own work. He worked here at Mammoth Cave. There's a bat species named for him, the big-eared Raffinesse bat. And that bat is one of eight bat species that calls Mammoth Cave home. There are 122 other species that live inside the cave. Now, that's why Mammoth Cave is a biosphere reserve. You see, there are so many different animals that live here, it makes it a special place. Now, Having said that, let me give you a little frame of reference. If I took a piece of plastic five feet by five feet and I put it on the rainforest floor and I collected every species of life below it and above it, I would probably have about 850 species of animal and plant in 25 square feet. Here, 400 miles of cave, only 130 species. It's tough to make a living here, and the animals that do are highly adapted. Some of them have the ability to fly at speeds of 35 miles an hour in complete blackness. Those are bats. Some of the animals, well, they use other senses to make their way through the cave. The pack rats will use a scent gland to make an awful stink. This is how bad it is. A human being with the bad sense of smell that we have, we can actually use pack rat trails to get out of caves. They're pretty smelly. Other animals, well, they just use their memory and their long antenna. The most important of those are the crickets. These crickets will stay inside the cave. They'll leave. They'll eat as much as they can. They'll make their way back into the cave and spend the next two weeks adjusting everything they just stuffed in. And when they digest it, they leave behind nutrients that support 30 different species of beetles. In fact, there's a beetle that is so specialized that it eats nothing but cricket eggs. Now the crickets have got on to this trick. So the female cricket, she's got a long ovipositor, a long egg layer. So what they used to do was dig a hole, lay an egg. But now these crickets have figured out what's going on so they'll dig 10 or 12 or 15 holes and lay one egg. So this poor beetle spends most of his time digging for a breakfast that's not there. Now these animals, well, most of them are, well actually all of them are not predators. Almost all of them are scavengers. There's so little energy here in the cave that being a predator is not going to work. Now the most interesting groups of these animals are probably the ones that live in the water at the very bottom of the cave. Those animals are very different. The complete darkness down there means that they don't have eyes. They don't have any coloration. Living in constant darkness, there's no need for those things. They can't survive in daylight. Ultraviolet radiation will kill them. Now, Instead of eyes, what they have are long nerves that go down either side of their body. And these nerves allow them to detect changes in temperature and water. And that's important for these little animals. You see, most of the time, these animals just lay around and don't do anything. Kind of like teenagers. And they'll lay there until they feel a change in temperature and pressure. They realize what's happening is it becomes the food. So they wake up. They eat as much as they can. And when they're done, well, they go back to sleep. Sometimes it may be eight months between meals. And because it's so long, these little animals have learned to turn their metabolism down to survive. And that ability has given them something else. You see, these little animals, they have a long life. If you take a crayfish that lives on the surface, it might live to be two or three years old. A crayfish in the cave, 75 years is not uncommon. 100 years is not unheard of. These little animals have a pretty good life, laying half asleep, waiting for the food to come, eating as much as they can. They have a pretty good life, and they have lots of it down at the bottom of the cave. Now, animals that live in water, that's why we're here. You see, a long time ago, if you'd been on this trip with me, 
If we had been here, say, 330 million years ago, give or take a week, we'd be holding our breath at the bottom of a shallow tropical sea. And in that sea, there were little animals that had a very serious problem. They were both squishy and delicious. And it's not easy to survive when you're both of those things. These little animals, they were going to have to adapt if they were going to survive. And they did adapt. And it was a brilliant, magical adaptation. You see, these little animals took parts of their body and they blended it with things they found in the seawater to create a magical substance we call calcium carbonate. They used it because it's pretty tough to make a shell. That shell protected them and allowed them to live out their life. Now, when they were done with the shell, they'd get rid of it. That shell would float to the bottom of the ocean. The waves down there and the pressure would crush that shell until it was just kind of a paste. And as the water kept pressing down on that paste, the rest of the moisture went away. And that paste turned into a rock made out of calcium carbonate. We call that limestone. We're surrounded by it. Now, there's about 100 feet of limestone above our heads. There's about 600 feet of limestone beneath our feet. And that limestone extends in every direction for between 50 and 300 miles. Now, all that limestone, I said it was magical. Why did I say calcium carbonate was magical? Because I bet you've eaten some. And I bet you ate it because it has curative properties. See, at some point in your life, I'm betting that you ate something that did not agree with you. It was too spicy. It was too hot. A little bit later, you're feeling it. And you go to the medicine cabinet and you rifle through it looking for a Rolaids or a Tums. There's one active ingredient in Rolaids and Tums. Calcium carbonate. If you have an upset stomach, you're going to eat a little of this rock. Now, I don't want to know how bad that first stomach ache was that made somebody decide I'm going to eat a rock, <laughs> but it worked. What that means is all this rock we're surrounded by, it's antacid. Now, rainwater is a little bit acidic because when it falls through the sky, it picks up a little carbon dioxide, it gets a little bit carbonated. That carbonated water, a little bit acidic, it's going to dissolve this rock. How does that happen? Well, look at this rock. You'll see that it's laid down in layers. And between the layers, there are cracks. That water is going to make its way into those cracks. So you'll start out with two layers of limestone pressed hard against each other. As it starts to dissolve, little passages will form. Given enough time, those passages can get pretty large, large enough to walk through and eventually large enough to create an echo here. And that's where we're standing. Now, the reason we're in Mammoth Cave and it's the longest cave in the world and we're standing in a passage that's roughly six and a half million years old, well, that has to do with another kind of rock above us. You see, after all this limestone was laid down, this was an ancient river delta on the surface. A lot of sand and mud wound up up there. That sand and mud turned into sandstone and shale. Those are different kinds of rocks. And that allows me to give you a little, a little medical advice today. If you have a really upset stomach, don't go eat sand. It's not going to help you. You see, sand is not an antacid. So the sandstone we have above us, that's not going to dissolve when that acidic rain hits it. The water's just going to run off to either side. What that means is Mammoth Cave has what most caves don't. We've got a roof. And as long as that sandstone, 50 or 60 feet here, as long as that's intact, this cave's going to last indefinitely. What happens when we get a hole in the sandstone? We well, can take a look right over here. You can see where a collapse occurred about 4 million years ago. Hundreds of tons of rock dirt, trees, and probably a few unlucky animals came pouring down into the cave. If you're on the surface, this is just behind what's known as the Sunset Lodge. There's a little bluff behind. This is the bottom of that bluff. If you take a look, from the inside of the cave, we call it Lookout Mountain. And if you're lucky, and it's a little bit flat, you can actually hear the water coming down there.
to Mammoth Cave, so we want to cover a little bit of everything. If you find the history of the early Americans interesting, we suggest you take a Violet City Lantern tour. That's going to take you in parts of the cave that are only lit with lanterns. There's no electric lights in that part of the cave. There are hundreds of thousands of formations just lying around, or not formations, artifacts rather, just lying around in that part of the cave. We're often asked, why don't we take those out and conserve them? Well, if a cave is doing the job for us for free and has done it well for 5,000 years, we will let it continue to do the work. You see the constant temperature here, the nitrates in the soil. And remember, nitrates are the things that will preserve a hot dog so well that archaeologists can identify them in a landfill after 150 years. Well, things in the cave are going to last. If you were interested in more recent stories, take a historic tour or a star chamber tour. It'll give you an idea of what those earliest visitors to the cave in the modern period found. If you like geology, take a domes and dripstones tour. Or take a Crazy Niagara tour. You'll see the parts of the cave where rock is still changing. But if this is your only trip with us, well, that's the other purpose. We want to give you a little taste of everything and hope that you'll come back or be encouraged to visit other caves. Folks, on behalf of myself and Mammoth Cave, we want to thank you so much for coming by and seeing us today. We want to wish you a safe and happy trip wherever you're headed next. Thanks very much. Thank you. So, do you not to see anything? Make sure I've got everybody safely out of the cave. Walk up the stairs when you get to the top. There's going to be that carpeted ramp, a couple of mats. I'm going to walk across that. Uh, okay. So we make Okay, so that was the historic entrance, huh? Yeah. That's interesting. New York subway tour. Okay, so that is the end of the historic tour entrance. Last ticket sold at 4.30. Okay, so we're good. Classic look. Look at this. this we drove up. You can see you get any horse, horse and buggies coming up yeah. this thing. She said to do the horse and buggy slave ride. Really? Yeah, that's what they said to do. Oh, the wow. Horse and buggy. Wow. Look how beautiful it is. They still have roses. Their roses. No are entrance here. Yeah, and we have parking. Parking here versus tickets. Tickets. Good tickets and parking. 
for tickets and parking. Okay, time to go in. Andrew Jackson's. This is actually the side of the house. That's because we're in the country. When they need to. Exactly. And where they go. Now the boys are worse than the girls. The boys will go anywhere. The girls like to be in the same spot. That white horse, that white horse on the other team, you'll walk off the side of the trail. So that you don't have to walk in it when she comes back around. <laughs> so even with everything against them, the people out here manage to create their own world. All the grass around us would have been worn down to the dirt clay soil from the traffic out here. What a big crowd of these people. Nobody's like this people when I've been back before. Several open fires would have been burning with large pots hanging on them. Chewing the onions, mixing soap, dipping candles, chopping wood, turning butter, butchering it. All the everyday chores took place in the northwest. 80% of the meat in their diet was pork. They added a little beef, chicken, and sheep, but most of the time, everyone ate pork. You know, if we have many people to eat that much pork, we estimate they would have had to butcher at least 300 hogs every year. Out in front of us on this side of the electric camp, from the curve in the road to the trees in this ground patch, where the vegetable garden was that served the match. This year we had corn growing in the brown patch on the other side and we have cotton. We invite you to stop by and pick a piece of two cotton to take along home with you. It's the only thing you can take from this historic museum. It's not a rock or a stick. <laughs> the guy we have wooden fencing all the way around it. It's a fence to have this is too small. Not it. Step up the bridge. This area here with the key log cap is called the first. Hermitage. We'll stop here on the way back. We can picking seeds out one by one. Come on. A person cleaning cotton by hand could work for 10 to 12 hours and only manage to clean one pound of cotton. Very slow process and think of that thing. There's a grassy spot out in this field shaped like a square. Continues over to the tree row. Can y'all see it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. That's where the cotton gin sat. Once they got the gin up and running, it made it possible to clean 70 pounds of cotton every day. Quite a difference, huh? Mm -hmm. We're looking at a 64 acre field here, folks. From that tree row yonder, all the way around to the one we're parked next to. In 1805, we know they planted 42 acres of cotton, about three-fourths of that field. By 1820, they were planting over 300 acres of cotton. 
Look how big 64 is. Imagine 300 by hand. And don't forget the wheat, corn, and oats, 100 acres each. Although the cotton gin was the start of the Industrial Revolution, it actually had a very negative impact on slavery. Now they needed more planters and pickers to get these large crops in and back out of the fields on time. Look, we've been small around the gym in the press. There's a picture of what that looks like hanging in the middle. The press is located out here. It's just a clean copy down here today. And it's really sweet to 500 pounds of beef. Here we're in Rockton, Burlock, Project Road. We can buy a wide bit. It's going to come over here. We can buy a lot of genetics and the other. That's the spot out in front of us. In between that wooden fence and the tree is where the overseer comes in. We know this because of the remains we found here, also because of its location. Halfway between the mountain and halfway between the field now. From here, you can keep an eye on everything and everybody. Overseers are always white, and we know on one occasion the general fired one. For being too cool. Everyone's interested in what kind of plantation on there was as he got. Well, we know he didn't have any problems with the institution of slavery. He looked at it as a lifestyle that was available if you could afford it. But there are other things we know about him. While he was in Washington, he had to write letters home. Several times he reminds his adopted son that one willing hand is worth more than two, four hands. Willing workers that respect their boss are more productive. He knew how to earn their respect, Junior. Junior. Here to complete a year. And don't you know they appreciate it? Slave workers to the rock. Little gardens on their own. Some were hired out to other plantations in the state of Tennessee as day laborers. And they were allowed to keep the portion of their pay in exchange for good behavior. So he was better than most. But every coin is too sadder when you get here. If your parents are living here, It's a lot less likely than that you would run away if you could do it. You could supplement your diet with wild game, fish, hard and vegetables. Then then you can need as many rations from the bed. You know the rations out here per worker per week. For three and a half pounds of pork and 32 cents of corn. It's all the cats of corn. They went from 32 to 36 cups. Access to the orchard was allowed. Dairy rations on a daily basis. Several pieces of knives and parts of gun. This is how we know for sure they were allowed in that place. Play of the big Texas off slow shit. Go past the bag in that grove of trees that time is all day. Haven't been dug up yet. These three out Reflections were divided in half. Each side had one ring, each family got one side. Two rings were 20 foot by 20 foot. Low. Same size as their allotted climbing spaces. Each room had a wooden floor, considered a luxury. One door, one window, one fireplace. Not much room for you in your family. So the grass out here was worn down too, because 90% of their living took place outdoors and around these buildings. While they were excavating these dwellings in each one, they found what they described as a clay pit. They had been dug in underneath the wooden floor. Baby, step up! After the construction was complete, <laughs> 
the people who live in these buildings. My God, my question. <laughs> they are very good size, but when I did not put rocks in the record, I was trying to get the side brick, you know, the side in the brickyard. Some of them weren't lying at all. They refer to them as roof cellars in the writing, because we found vegetable and animal related there. But we found a lot of other objects too. So. And those objects bring up a food room to these clay pits, Heidi Hall. <laughs> we found slate and slate pencils. Oh. It was illegal for them to know who I really know. We found a person of one man to a rag dog. Pork pistol, pork of pork, easy mile. Several pierced coins, probably worn around the neck or around the ankle for good luck. One of the Pierce points has an Islamic inscription on it, written in Arabic. We found cowrie shells. Normally, you only find those kinds of seashells in the Indian Ocean and on the west coast of Africa. Several round stone models with X's carved in them in three glass amulet shapes like a human fist. <laughs> Evidence of that secret smuggling network that goes on. They brought them with them and hid them in this very field, where they remained safe until 1998 when we found them. That's an incredible journey. Okay, we'll see you later. It has an excellent example of a roof cellar. The whole building is filled with a dwelling for the non-original enslaved people that came to the city. Hey. Alfred was born in the north side in the kitchen of this cabin. In 1804, they had nine enslaved people. In 1821, when they moved into the mountain, between 60 and 80, in 1845, at the time of his death, an official count was made, 150. The numbers always went up, very few were ever sold. Two other log duplexes were located out here also. You can see the covering where the first thing is at. This locust came back to us in the middle where the second one was. All that visible on both ends are rocks from the fireplace. That cabin with the single chimney is where the Jacksons lived for 17 years. They bought the property when they bought it, built by Nathaniel Hayes. But it was a two-story cabin about that. Kind of tall and square and stockade looking. Step up. When the Jacksons moved in, they no longer remained an ordinary structure cabin. They took beautiful hardwood flooring down on first floor, which is one large room to see the conversation room. Miss Rachel had first floor papers hanging on the wall. She loved that cabin. She was a cupcake girl. Lit upstairs on a three roof. And all the way in two bedrooms. Well, after they moved in to the mansion, they got that two-story building here. Just not fit for an enslaved person to live in. So, they drop the second floor up on the scaffold. Then log by log, board by board, pulled the first floor up and underneath. Then they lowered the second floor down, creating a similar dwelling to the other three and the one you see today. This is how the limitations were set up. Leave them all. Field workers out back. To the field. In the center, industrial workers lived where the industry was located, up and around the house and back to We figure about 50 people in each of the three locations. They drank up and built 1940 years later. When he visited his offices, today he went out to take his meetings ready. Roof top, now the next few years to be converted to the field behind those people. Is the storm. And I told you that storm doesn't put out the volume. So if water's not running through the 
Different tones would have signaled to people living in these three dwellings as to who was needed in the house when they run. Outside the top lecture, our example of the door. One other last note about Alfred. When the ladies opened this place up to the public in 1889, tours were 10 cents, and Alfred was their very first. If you have questions, be happy to try and answer. If you haven't been through the mansion, tours start on the front porch every 10 minutes. This is the back porch. There's the formal gardens found the cemetery off to the east. Alfred's buried in the family cemetery. Then after you've had a good look around, this path here will take you right back out to the visitor center. Thanks for riding the wagon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to the uh, south shore. Mm -hmm. We were about a half mile from the, between Long Island and the barrier reefs, you know. Okay. I've forgotten what those barrier reefs, uh, not or reefs. Jones Island, or Jones Beach, you know? well, school districts are exceptional. Ours yeah. was exceptional. Yeah, they're not afraid to tax, but. Uh, they're not they're afraid to tax. Okay, let's go back. Yeah, let's go. This was good one. The whole the guy gave you a by going on that waving tour, you really got the whole flavor of it. Yes. You know, the fact that he was a slave, that he kept families together. I mean that was all from his home. Right. You know. Yeah, see it's a mile and a half to go all around. Yeah, yeah. And it's a little bit hot. <laughs> This is the Hermitage, the first. Okay, Mom, here. let's go. All the trees in the front of the house weren't there initially. Look at these trees on. Look at and uh, with There's the giant leaves. Like God. Like, they almost look figgy, but they look nice. Uh -huh. And next to them is something too. They would have had some trees all over the place. Ellie Drive, look out at night. It looks all new Thank here, man. Right. On this side.
Okay. Grand old Opry. There she is. Now, famous country music hall. Oh, Beautiful day, wow. I do. There you go. Yeah, Diana, stand right here. Come here, come closer to me. Yeah, perfect. Okay, there she is. I'm gonna put the iPad out now. I'm gonna send pictures to your brothers and sisters.